Okay, hello everybody. This is weird speaking into a microphone. Uh, this is my quick little seminar, talk, lesson, whatever, of how I think it's advisable to get past if we want. Clicker. Yes. So, meet Kian. You might have heard of him before. He's pretty good at like uh, clock and stuff. And uh, <laughs> He is going to be our example guy. He's going to go from being absolutely terrible to being world class after this seminar. So, Keon's starting out. And there are a lot of term uh, terms and stuff that he just doesn't understand. So I'm just going to go through it. And for you guys who already know, bear with me. So, there, when you see M2OP, you probably see that on forums and stuff like that. That means M2, an edges method an old Pockman and a corners method. So old Pockman is a quick corners method where you essentially do a Y perm without the F and the F prime at the end. And uh, that swaps two corners and two edges. And we, by setting up uh, other corners to a specific spot, we're able to cycle the corners around and solve them. And then with M2, we use an M2, just like that Y perm, to solve all the edges. And then old Pockman edges, are uh, something like, similar where we use PLLs to solve ed uh, two edges and in two to seven edges. So a buffer is where we uh, cycle pieces through. So if we see one piece in the buffer, we shoot that to where it's supposed to be, and then we uh, that's swap, and we go to the next piece, and so on. And a cycle break is when we hit the buffer and the cube is not solved, so we have to shoot to a random place, keep going. This is important for later on, so bear with me. So, Keon's probably done a few solves right now, he's found a YouTube tutorial. He's got over the part where it's, it's a gimmick, and he's solved it, and he's like, oh my gosh, I can solve a Rubik's Cube blindfold, I'm a genius. So, he's probably thinking, this is really boring. Like, this is just all out, this is the most boring thing ever, it's terrible. Why would I ever do this? Why would I ever practice? I still think that too sometimes, but, uh, let me tell you why it's uh, a bit more interesting than that. So, commutators. This is how you get into the advanced three blind. So commutators, you all probably know a commutator right now. If you all know an A perm, you know a commutator. So the basic notation for commutators, and I'm, I'm going to get into what a commutator is first, but I want to show you what the notation is. So if you, you ever see a notation like that in those little parentheses, we turn it into that. So we have uh, one part A, comma B, and then we can do A, do B, then we do the opposite of A, then we do the opposite of B. So, commutators. Commutators are really, really cool, and if you understand them, you will be a lot better at not only three line but CPOP solving and a lot of other things. So pay attention to all of you two handed solvers. So, commutators, they have an insert and an interchange. The insert inserts a specific sticker into a, little, into a face without messing up the rest of the face. So, if you guys want to try this with one of the, with the cube that you probably have in your hands right now, Try that insert right there uh, on the top right. Notice how it only affects one sticker on the top face. And then if you want to do the interchange, go ahead. Then go back to the insert and do the inverse of that. So R prime D prime R, and then do U prime. If you do that, you will have a commutator. You just cycle three corners. So I, I'm, I know this is really quick and everything, but we're going to get into how to get better at commutators soon. So, the last bit about notation, if you see that F there that's in the blue, that's how we uh, do a setup. So, that is not part of the commutator, but we do the setup move, then we do the commutator, then you undo the setup move. And that's basic free bar. Okay, so some clarification for you guys. There, within the commutator line method, there kind of two methods that are spoken about. There is BH, Bayer Hardwick, that is move optical commutators. Now, you probably know from CPOP and other things that move optical is not always the best. If you're doing a bunch of Fs and Bs and terrible moves like that, it's not always great. So, freestyle is what uh, the common name is for the popular blind method. That's speed optimal commutators. So that means it might not be the most move optimal. It might look crazy. It might look like some sort of beginner A perm or something that you have no idea what uh, why anyone fast would use it, but believe me, that's all important, the speed in these commutators. Okay, so, continuing with commutators. Noah Arthur's tutorial is your friend. I know I'm supposed to be doing a tutorial right now, but if you want to learn, 
watch Noah Arthur's tutorials. It is best by far. They aren't supposed to be easy. This, these are hard. You're going to have to spend a lot of time just practicing and doing example solves. And if you're watching TV and you scramble the cube, you say, okay, let's figure out this commutator instead of, okay, let's do another meaningless C pop solve. So, when in doubt, you, you just have to practice. Nobody is, is good at these at the start. And finally, most important, time them. Time them. If you want to know if a commutator is good, time it. If you can do it fast, it's probably decent. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. It's also the only thing, the good thing about roots. So, the four movers, also known as the Rue comm, to me. So, if you're familiar with Rue, this is kind of the last step of uh, the last six edges before you're done with solve. So, if you guys want to try that four mover on your cues, so that's the commutator notation, and then that's the full out on the right side. That was an interesting one for edges. It's really fast and really useful to know. And then you can try and uh, set up to it with the U move. That's what we call the typically the five mover, and because you cancel uh, the end. And here's an interesting one is that root same root comp, that's how we can break down a uh, very common A perm people use, U perm people use. So if you guys look at that U perm, that's how we write the commutative notation. And you guys probably already know that because it's really common. It's very good out. So this is another really important part is you have to understand how to do these root comps and you have to understand how to do them everywhere. You have to understand how to do them with E moves, with S moves, with M moves, everywhere. It's so, so important. Okay, so a little side note for all of you guys who are probably getting bored right now because you're like, oh, I don't care what's through line. So, check out these two pictures right there. On the left, we have a quick case for, and this is for F2L. So we're, if you we want to put that white and orange edge into the second layer for F2L, you use that algorithmic picture. If you guys want to try that right now. I know E moves seem weird, and they seem weird to everyone at the start, but this is the, these are the ways that you can implement these uh, comms into your uh, c flop and other solving, and they're best, the best outs, like hands down. No, nobody will disagree with you uh, if you use those. And then if you want to look over there, on the right side, I know it's a bit, the uh, a bit to the left, but that's a quick corner case. So if we want to put that corner with the green uh, sticker in the bottom, we could use a very, very fast commutator. And yeah, so there's just like very, uh, two of the ways that you can implement commutators with other solves, and I highly recommend that you all do because I just want to see the speed cubing limits pushed, and this is definitely the way to do it. Okay, so. Keon is probably uh, a bit bored right now, but anyways, he's getting into this uh, parity. And so parity is a, a time when we only have one more corner target before we hit the buffer, and we only have one more edge target. So, how do we do that? We have to use a PLL. Par parity is caused by odd moves in the scramble, but we have to use a uh, PLL because we're blindfolded and it's hard to, you know, solve parity off, move off. So, the swap, that is where, in memorization, we take one edge and we pretend it's another edge. So essentially we set up so that there are two edges swapped. And because if you did that when you have no parity, if you swap two edges when you have no parity, then you would get a, get a case, you wouldn't be able to finish. But when you do have parity and you swap two edges, then you'll be able to finish normally with only edge commutators. And then you can go to corners and you can finish with some sort of PLL or old pop you know, or something. Now, you see here, the tulip last layer of three blind. So, there's an interesting thing is that we're not really doing parity. Like, I'm not doing parity, I, I don't know. This is what I use, but I'm not doing real parity. There's only one man in the world who does real parity, and that's Gianfranco Bonfi. So, full parity is essentially where we swap any edge and any corner. So, if you have the last corner target from your buffer, and then you, you have an out for every single edge, edge target that would go along with that. So if you guys want to think about that, that's like 420 outs. It's like the ZBLL, ZBLL, Canadian, of uh, three blind. So this is really hard, hard to learn, obviously. Like, there's only one guy in the world who's learned it. And uh, the reason that he's learned it instead of just doing this swap is because Technically, the swap will sometimes give you extra outs. And I'm not going to go too deep into the math, but basically about 50% of the time, we'll have to do an extra commutator to set up for the swap. And that's why it's 
debatably slower. But also, full parry, like the DLL is probably not, is not optimized, so uh, the benefits of each are still arguable. But if, if you ever see anyone mention full parity, that's what it is. Wait, so yeah, for full parity, it decreases your com count. It's like, like the DLL, basically. It's really, really fun. Like, I, I know a few, it's very fun, and if you guys want to get into that, you can definitely uh, try, but I don't recommend learning it at all until you've basically done everything. If, if, if you're at the point where you're just, you, you know everything, you're like crazy world class, and you want to try it, go for it, but up until then, it's just, there's so many other things you can do. It's just like learning ZBLO when you're sub 30. It, it's not worth it. Okay, so, how to make your own luck. Because free blind, if you haven't figured it out already, is a really luck dependent event. Like everything, it, it's all L, it's like square one or something. It, it's a lot of L. So, if you're just doing plain commutators, you're really dependent on how the scrambler's gonna be. So, here are a few ways that uh, myself and other top line solvers uh, basically create our own luck. We make bad scrambles good. And we're gonna get into all these uh, coming up. So. Floating commutators. Basically, we're avoiding cycle breaks. So, uh, not, I hope you guys can see this. Uh, I just took two angles of the cube. But basically, if you see, we have a U perm uh, on the front three edges on the top, and then the top buffer will be solved. So, we'd have to do another cycle break. We'd have to shoot to an, uh, an unsolved piece, right? If we're just using one buffer. But floating commutators. That's where we use more than one buffer. So if you hit the buffer piece early in the solve, then you move to the next buffer. And then if you hit that buffer piece, you move to the next buffer. Some of you can use mega mix and have a fixed order for your F2L or S2L or something. Uh, we'll find it kind of similar is that a lot of us have a fixed order for our buffers, and that basically decreases the thinking involved, so you just automatically go here, 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 here. And uh, then when you're, when you're done, you know, you turn as fast as possible and hope the best. So, Cycle breaks. Sometimes you're going to have to cycle break. Like, th there's just no getting around it. You have to think about this, and you have to experiment, and this is where experience comes in. Not all commutators are, as, are the same speed. Some are going to be way faster than others. So you have to do some experiment, and you have to time your commutators. And then when you get to a cycle break, you say, oh, I could shoot it to this piece and do uh, really, really fast, like, one out in half a second, or you could shoot it to another piece, and it would take, like, two seconds to do the yeah. So you have to do, you have to think, and you have to realize that some hours are faster than others, and you have to be able to uh, force your way into those. So, cool parity swaps. You know how I was talking about uh, swaps before, so the most common swap probably is the UL, UB swap for parity, that, because that's what people are usually used to from M2, and so uh, you do that, but why do you have to do that? For parity, you have to swap two edges. But why don't you swap like the UL and the UR edge and you could do it set up to a T-perm. So this is just like completely uh, an experimentation thing and it doesn't always work, believe me, I've tried. But it, it does help and it can definitely uh, help you out. So if, just as a quick example, if you hit your buffer for corners, but FUR and FDR, if you want to look that on your cube, are still swapped, and you're going into edge metal, well, you know, think about it. You could set up to many different PLLs, and this is where PLL and other, you know, one lick last layer and things are really, really important and really, really helpful. So, the last thing is, or not the last thing, but two swaps, or you might have seen them called 2E2D. So, an H perm is a two swap. That's where we swap two edges and another two edges, right? Because we can't swap only two edges on the three bet the cube. It just doesn't work that way. So, here are some common ones. The H perm, M2, U2, M2, U2, uh, R2, U2 times three, Z perm, and then for corners, we could do something like the E perm, or the H perm plus U2, you'll notice we'll actually switch uh, corners diagonally on one face. So these are another thing that if you, uh, Try and implement it to solve. If you see two edges already swapped and you want to do another swap even without parity, these are things that you should just definitely experiment with. And I know if it doesn't make any sense, just ignore me. Think H perm, H perm. How can I use H perm? How can I use a Z perm? How can I use 
X, some X perm or something like that in your salt, and eventually you'll start to figure these things out. So you guys probably think I'm an idiot for forgetting to mention memo and talking about execution all the time. So you're half right, I'm not very intelligent, but coming into this part, the memo time. So how do we do corner memo? How, what's the best way to do corner memo? Let, let, with this example memo, I'll uh, kind of give you uh, a show. So, C N D P O X. Imagine that's your uh, corner memo. Make words. So, C N. Uh, Eric, what's the word for C N? Cinema. Cinema. Okay, cinema. That's interesting. Uh, D P. Hudson, what's the word for D P? Drop. Drop. Good. What about O X? This is a tough one. Ox. Oh, yeah, good. That's actually that's exactly what it is. So, you have to make your own letter pairs. That's the biggest thing. Is it, like many of my letter pairs are based around members of my family and friends and such, and you have to do the same because that's the only way these are going to stick. That's the only way you're going to be able to store these and work with these. And trust me, I try, when I started out, I try following all the fast cubers and be like, oh, what do you use for this? What do you use for this? And it just never worked. So you have to work. And I'm sorry for some people who have probably asked me in the past, about letter pairs and I've just kind of blown them off, but believe me, I'm doing you a favor by not telling you mine, because you have to work these out. But if I were to give you, to give you one tip, don't do one of the things with a lot of syllables. So, Eric, that was, that was a good one, cinema, but I would suggest you do something like can for CM, just because that's one syllable, and then drop is a good one, and ox is a good one. So, because syllables add up, even if you're saying them in your head, they will add up and they will cost you things. And it, especially if you say them out loud, that's even, that, that, that even uh, wastes more time. So, let's go to edge memo. Imagine we have the same letters. What I usually do is I group them into four and I just do audio sounds. So if I did the first uh, four letters, I would do cam dog. That's what I say in my head. That's all I do. And then I would go to the next four, and I know I only put six on there, I should have put more, but let's say we had O-X-L-E, Kandop, Oxley. That's my entire memo. And honestly, I think you guys should definitely go for that. The reason that we do kind of a uh, more long-term memo with corners and then a shorter-term memo with edges is because the kind of suggested order is for solving is we memorize corners, then we memorize edges, then we execute edges, then we execute corners. And because we're executing edges right after we memorize them, it's better to do kind of a short-term audio, but with uh, corners, it's better to do slightly long-term just to keep it in your head. Because audio, pure audio sounds for the whole thing, it, it's, it's pretty hard, especially when you have background noise and such. So the final thing is, and I'm not going to go too, into much detail is, is experiment with visual memos. So visual memo is where we're not actually memorizing these letters or anything. So this is really useful for flipping, edges or twisting corners when you're not really memorizing like a certain uh, letter pair or anything and you just say like oh I have to do this flipping out or I have to do twist these two corners and uh, usually if you're memorizing something visually memorize it at the very end and then execute it immediately so you do not want to forget that that's like the number one cause of all my DNS is forgetting visual uh, pieces okay so let's get into a few advanced memo and first of all, I'm just going to say this is not important, like at all. You do not need to be doing this stuff until you're like sub 30 or even faster. But if you want to get into some things, two color memo. I'm ready to show some examples of that. That's where we, you only uh, look at two colors in the corner and you're able to guess what the third color is, like on the back face. And that means you don't have to tilt the cube as much. And I know that doesn't seem like much if you're just starting out with line solving, but trust me, the tilts add up after a while. And then, and then that's the thing is, move your hands quickly when you're taking the box off and when you're putting the blindfold on, and that's all, all there is, a lot of what the best memo is. If you do those things, and if you just practice and practice and practice, you will definitely get your memo down to a very fast time. But honestly, just go practice commutative stuff. Way more important. You'll get way more improvement from just working on your execution. Okay, so here we have a couple of examples. So, uh, if you see my orientation, and I'm sorry, we're doing it in my orientation, is blue top, white front. And so if you guys could see that corner at the very top, could anyone tell me what the color on the back face might be? Just blue. Green. Yeah? Blue. Very good. So, yeah, that's, 
this is, uh, these are uh, just, just different ways we use uh, to color. And then same with on the top one right now, on the, on the right side. What is the color of that? Yellow. Yellow? Good. So yeah, you guys are pretty good at this already. And I think uh, things like two-sided PLO recognition might help you. Uh, they have, there are similar skills involved. So definitely try this out if you are looking to get into more kind of advanced memorization techniques. But as I said before, it's not important if you're just starting out. So, thoughts on buffers. So, you've probably heard if you've followed any sort of blind social media or just QB social media, you've probably heard many arguments about what buffer should I use? What buffer's better? What buffer's faster? What buffer should I switch to? Blah, blah, blah. So, probably the main one, the main battle was the UF versus the DF buffer people. And I was on DF for a long time, so believe me, I, I know both sides of the argument. So the reason many people started with DF was because they used the M2 method, which uh, means that DF was our buffer and we would shoot to the UP D piece with an M2 and uh, set pieces up to the UP piece. So DF is not a bad buffer. I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna say it like it's terrible, you should never use it. You can be very, very fast with DF. Like there is nobody in the world who has reached a, a spot with any other buffer uh, where DF couldn't follow it with enough practice. So, yeah, don't, don't feel bad if you use DF. But the reason that people switch to UF, why I switch to UF, is because it uses a lot more U moves, and uh, essentially it, it's like DF upside down, right? So uh, when we use UF, we use a lot more U moves, and uh, a combination of U, R, and E moves is a lot faster than a combination of R, E, and D moves. And uh, if you guys have ever, basically have ever picked up a cube, you know what I'm talking about. So that's the basic thing, and then just from uh, endlessly timing commutators, we've uh, kind of settled on the fact that UF is slightly better than that, yeah, than that regard. So onto corners. So uh, this is another situation where the kind of beginner methods influence people's choice of buffer. So UFR and UBL are kind of the two common corner buffers right now. UBL because people use both Pachman, and UFR because it's better. <laughs> but UFR, again, it's just, it has a few faster commutators, and uh, if I were starting out, I would definitely check uh, UFR out, because I think it, it is better, for sure. And then at UBR is also, uh, it's very, it's in its infancy, but I think it, it has tremendous potential, it's probably better than UBL, so definitely try them out, uh, talk to some people, but yeah, I think currently UFR, if you're starting out, use UFR. And then, but anyways, hard work is that matters. Like, it doesn't matter what you use, you could be using, there's a Chinese person who I think is sub-30, who uses DBL as a corner buffer. You can use any sort of, of uh, corner or edge buffer, and if you put in enough work, you will be fast. Okay, so people are always saying like, Orozco, Orozco is this new beginner intermediate method. No, no, just, just no. Don't get into that. And I will uh, show you why. So the reason we don't want to get into Orozco is first I'm going to explain what Orozco is. That's where we learn only one set of commutators. So if you want to learn, learn how to cycle, let's say, the UFR, UBR, and then to uh, any other uh, sticker on the queue. So it's around 20 commutators, give or take, and uh, people often like it when they're first starting out, but the problem with this is that they learn these like algorithms, they learn these like PLLs, and that is a bad, bad habit. You cannot learn these, these commutators like Alex. You have to understand them, you have to make them yourself, or at least make some yourself and then learn the, the new ones and learn how they work before you'll be able to implement them and solve properly. And if you just use, uh, if you're scared away by the hundreds and hundreds of uh, commutators you have to know, just know that it's not like ZDLL. These are, you can figure them all out on your own. And that's why I don't like the Roscoe's because it's teaching you to treat this like Alex. And this is not, even though I say Alex a lot, this, these aren't PLLs, these aren't OLLs, these are commutators, and you have to understand them. So, common questions I get are, when to learn freestyle? Everyone's like, should I learn freestyle when I'm sub two? Should I learn freestyle when I'm sub one, when I'm sub 30, when I'm whatever? Yes, 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 yes. 
whenever you're aboard, whenever you want to get into uh, faster through line solving, learn freestyle, learn about commutators. You cannot hurt yourself by learning too early. I learned when I was, I think, averaging about three or four minutes. John Franco Franke learned when he was like averaging five or six minutes, I think. I'm not sure. But he, he wasn't very fast when he was starting to learn it. A lot of people who are really fast now started when they were not very fast. So it, it's essentially like learning F2L. It's like, should I learn F, wait till, uh, to switch from layer by layer until I'm sub 30? No. You, you guys can all answer that question. Well, this is the exact same thing. If you want to get fast, start. There's no harm to the volume. So yeah, and again with the more advanced things. Start it. The, the main thing about Reblind is that people want to get a success and they want to say, oh, I solved the blindfold, but then they're done. And those people that want to keep going and go fast, well, what's the point if you get 10 DNFs every day, if you're learning and you're improving and you're getting better, eventually you won't get those DNFs and eventually those times will change from four minutes to one minute to 17 seconds. Work hard. These are, this is the most important thing about free blind is that many, many people have been, uh, achieved world record class times in free blind far quicker than they have in uh, other, other events. And that's because they break it down. They're methodical. They say, what am I bad at? And I will get better at it. Take it as a challenge. If you screw something up, say, okay, let's figure out why I did it. Let's figure out, figure out how I can be better. And let's do it now. Don't. Don't be bored, essentially, and this, this goes on with the other things. Is don't just do boring solving. If you're about to try a new technique, and then you're like, oh, I got a good scramble, I'm gonna get a, a meaningless 37 second PP. Don't, don't. What does that mean to you? you you're gonna break the PP the next comp if you learn this advanced thing. So why should you just safely get a meaningless time, especially if it's at home? Go for broke. Do whatever you can. Learn, learn, learn. Try things. That's probably the most important thing, is just try new things, test things out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, practice it, uh, get good at it. And quit lying to yourself about moves. So a lot of people, I get these questions a lot, they're like, oh, I want to get into three blind uh, and get fast, but I can't do S moves, I can't do E moves, I can't do M moves. You're lying to yourself, you can't. Nobody is good at this. Like, if you want to think about before you were a cuber, nobody can turn that the cube as fast as anyone in this room without any practice. You have to practice, you have to get used to it. And this is the exact same thing. You have to get used to the finger tricks. It's not going to be easy at first, but if you're methodical about it, if you work hard, it's not going to be like a, a huge ordeal as well. So I just want to touch on one last thing, is uh, my thoughts on hardware. A lot of people are always asking, what's the best piece of free part? And essentially, I, I would have the same response that uh, Felix Zemdex did when people ask, a dozen people ask him about 3 by 3 is, I don't know if you've seen that video of him where he did 12 uh, solves on 12 different cubes and got an insanely fast average. But again, you, you don't need a specific cube. Just get a good cube and take care of it, you know? Make sure it's evenly tensioned, make sure it's not too slow, too fast, controllable, and just, yeah, take, take good care of your cube. Loop the core often, and uh, yeah. And slice moves are, are important in three point if you haven't figured it out already. So if you, that's the one thing you might want to consider is that make sure you're able to do slice moves. And that gets into magnets. Is that magnets are uh, kind of another debatable topic in the three point world right now. I personally use magnets. I know some other people who use magnets, but a lot of people don't. And I would say that if they help you, use them. If they don't help you, don't use them. And so essentially what I would say for any other event. Is that sometimes it is harder to do slice moves on a really, really strongly magnetized cube, but sometimes it's harder to turn accurately on a cube with no magnets. So find something that works for you. It doesn't have to be the GTS version one like everyone seems to use. It doesn't have to be you know a really expensive cube. It doesn't have to be a budget cube. Just find something that works and stick with it. Okay, so this is my final thoughts. Three point. It's, it, in general, it's a good event. I like the event. I, I mean, obviously, I like the event. I spend way too much time to not like the event. But if you guys want to just shake things up, it's very, very different from all the cited events. So I strongly encourage you, even if you don't want to spend an hour a day learning commutators and experimenting, try it out. Because when you get into these commutators and when you get into these advanced things, 
it makes that cube a puzzle again for you. It makes it something that you have to figure out and you have to think, how am I going to do this? How should I do this? Instead of some F2L and CFOP solve that you've done uh, 40,000 of in your life. So try it out. It's something new. It, it's going to make this cube interesting for you again. And I think that's probably the most important thing you can get out of the Ruby cube. So uh, is there, are there any questions? <laughs>